All right, so quickly we're going to hit the skeletal system, the articulations and joints, etc. Now, first and foremost, when we talk joints, a couple of key words you want to pick up on is the word articulation. Anytime you see the word articulation, we use that to mean a joint. So literally, we're talking where bones meet. Now, the big thing here, too, to recognize is the function of the joints holding the bones together, allowing for mobility. And then we classify joints in terms of function and in terms of structure. Now, one of the things you want to remember is the basics of a joint. Okay, we've already talked about this. It's one of the it's the connective tissue membrane. And we called it synovial. Now, Synovial joints are actually a special type of structural classification for the joints, so keep that in mind. All right, first and foremost, functional based on amount of movement, structural based on composition. So, synarthroses, immovable, amphiarthroses, slightly movable, diarthroses, freely movable. Okay, diarthroses are synovial. We see synovial membranes at all diarthroses. Now, structural classification, fibrous, cartilaginous, synovial. Again, we're talking about the composition of the joint. We're talking about what holds the bones together. Okay, so first off, synarthroses, immovable. Typically, we see this associated with sutures, okay, cranial bones. It literally looks like seams. It looks like they grew together. Okay, we'll, you'll talk about this on the next PowerPoint, but we associate these types of suture joints with what we call um, intramembranous ossification. And if you break the word down, you can tell exactly what it means. Um, and an intramembranous ossification, that's what seems to allow it to grow together so that it literally looks like it's been um, forged together and seamed together. The other type is gomphoses. Gomphoses, what are known as peg and socket, this is what all of your teeth are. And we don't really want our teeth to be movable, don't we? So it kind of makes sense. Now, amphiarthroses are slightly movable. You see this at different areas of the body. Um, and again, it has to do with when and what's going on. So here you can see um, movement here is going to depend on the length of fibers. We need some movement in terms of the distal uh, distal joint between the tibia and the fibula. Okay, We also see an amphiarthroses um, at the pubic symphysis. And again, the pubic symphysis, we've talked a little bit about that in class, that's the joint that's going to actually separate a little bit during uh, childbirth. Okay, And again, when we talk about the joints and you look at the different types of joints and we talk about the classification of joints, you know, functional and structural, keep in mind what the function of the joint is. So tie this in in terms of what's going on and what we need to happen with the bones as a whole, with, with movement as a whole, with what we need to happen where those joints combine. For example, right here at the lumbar going into the sacrum, do we really want that to be moving a lot? Well, all of our weight's distributing there. If it's freely movable, like what we would see at our knee or elbow, or if it's completely immovable, like we see with our teeth, peg and socket, again, how is that going to impair function? So we need, keep that in mind. You always want to make that link between form and function. Okay, now diarthroses are freely movable joints. The most common type of diarthroses is going to be our synovial joints. Now this figure is in your book. You need to pick up on a couple of things. First, um, we see capsule, meaning we have a cavity. So when we talk about the joint cavity, you also hear that referred to as a capsule. We're talking about a standalone cavity that is not open to the outside area. Now, within that cavity, you can see that we have different structures. Okay, we have the hyaline cartilage, which is this area in green. The cartilage, and, and guys, this is the thing you want to pick up on too. The cartilage the the synovial capsule itself, the tendons, the ligaments, the periosteal covering, all of that, all of that connective tissue literally kind of grows into each other and that's what creates 
these standalone compartments. That's what creates the strength. That's why when you pull a muscle or a muscle is pulling on the bone, you see um, potential changes in the shape of that bone. And we'll talk about that when we talk about remodeling. In essence, what you want to pick up on here is that you see we have the ligament. The ligament's continuous with the bone. The ligament is typically to the outside of the joint capsule. Okay, you see the tendon sheath. Okay, we see bursa. Bursa are simply sacs for padding that help to uh, cushion as the joint moves, depending on what's going on. Here's an articular capsule. Here's the synovial membrane. You know, you want to pay attention and be able to label and recognize all of these parts. Now, cartilage, in general, as a general rule, cartilage usually is a pad between opposing bones. It cushions the ends of bones, etc. Ligaments provide support and strength to the overall joint. For example, if you look at the joint, the ligaments around the shoulder, the pectoral girdle, as opposed to the pelvic girdle or the hips, you can see that there is literally a structural difference in the ligaments. There's a structural difference in the type of joint, which we'll be talking about, ball and socket. There's a structural difference in how the bones fit into the cavity, the glenoid fascia and the humerus versus the acetabulum and the femur. And that difference leads towards what we associate, again, with that form and function. We see less mobility in the hip joint as opposed to the pectoral joint, but we see a lot more stability with the pelvic joint as opposed to the pectoral joint. And all of that ties in here. Now, bursa simply flattens sacs. Notice what they're lined with, and then you have tendon sheets. So if you have tendonitis, tendonitis itis is talking about something with this tendon sheet, etc. Bursitis, we're talking about a bursa, etc. Now, joints. We have six basic types of joints. Okay. The first is a gliding joint and then the hinge joint. Hinge joint, literally single plane of movement, so elbow, knee, okay. Sliding joints or gliding joints, um, notice it says acromioclavicular, so that's where the clavicle and the acromion process meet together, and notice sternoclavicular. And so again, remember, if you put your hand on that jugular notch and you lift your right arm, so you have your left hand on that jugular notch and you lift your right arm, you can feel how the clavicle moves on the sternum. It's not what we would typically associate with movement. It's kind of this gliding moment. Now, also notice the intercarpal and intertarsals. That's how those work together. Okay, the next two, pivot joint and ellipsoidal joint. Uh, ellipsoidal we associate with the carpal, so your wrist. You can't quite move it in a perfect circle, but it's pretty close to being freely moving that way. Pivot joint, again, atlas and axial, and then the proximal radial ulnar joint. And again, we've seen that because when you look at the radius and the ulna, okay, again, at that other end where the radius ties in with the humerus, you remember it was circular. That head was circular. So, of course, that's going to be a pivot joint. Now, the last two are saddle joint, ball and socket. Saddle joint, we associate with the thumb. Okay, again, if you look at your thumb, it doesn't move in a circle. It literally moves only in two directions, and it's a very kind of disjointed if you try to take it around. Ball and socket, femur and acetabulum, glenoid fascia and the humerus, those are huge. Ball and socket has the greatest freedom of motion, and we get the most movements out of those joint types. Okay, so the movements this leads to. Um, flexion, extension, rotation, circumduction, abduction, adduction. Okay, flexion, we decrease the angle of a joint. Extension, we increase the angle of a joint. So you can see flexion, extension, flexion right here. Extension, if you actually, you can also flex at the hip. So if you bring this, if you lift your leg up this way, we see flexion right here at the hip joint. If you take the leg back due to contraction of the hamstrings and the glutes, you're actually opening up this joint and that would be extension. So you can see all the different ways you can get extension and flexion. Now rotation and circumduction and then um, abduction and adduction. Okay, Rotation again at the neck. You can see that with the leg too. We can actually cause our feet to rotate out or rotate in. You can do the same thing with the arm. If you stand in anatomical position and you turn your whole arm so that your thumb is now 
posteriorly pointed, you can see that you have a twist to the arm. You have a rotation of the arm. Now, circumduction is literally just that movement in a circle. Now, adduction and abduction, as it said, we're talking about decreasing or increasing the angle. So, from our midline, okay, so here's our midline, roughly, okay. So, if I move away from the midline, that's abduction, abduction, ab is to take away. Adduction is to move towards the midline. So, you can see, and you can obviously, you can do the same thing with the legs. You could bring them towards the midline or away from the midline, etc. Okay, the next set. Uh, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion. Typically we associate these with the foot. Dorsiflexion is kind of odd when you think about it, as well as plantar flexion. Flexion implies decreasing the joint. Well, what's interesting is when you look at dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, notice dorsiflexion is literally we push our heel down and we lift our toes. In other words, we're taking our toes literally towards the dorsum side. Which is interesting because when you look at plantar flexion, well, plantar, remember, plantar refers to this surface, okay? This surface of the foot is known as the plantar surface. And plantar flexion means we take our toes away. So you can see that we seem to have flexion in this direction, plantar flexion, because we are exposing the plantar surface, that's why it's flexion. And this is dorsiflexion, again, we're decreasing the angle. and so you see they're both being called flexion, but recognize what you're doing. Plantar, you're standing on your tiptoes. Dorsiflexion, you're standing on your heel. Now, inversion and eversion, same idea, inversion, eversion. Usually you see inversion and eversion especially associated with um, injuries. If you twist your ankle, the most common ankle twist or the most common ankle injury is usually an inverted injury, meaning you're on the outside of the foot, your ankle rolls to the outside, to the lateral side you don't see a lot of injuries where it seems to be rolling to the in the medial side. So recognize that this is the lateral side and this is the medial side when we talk inversion and eversion as well. All right, uh, now supination, pronation, and opposition. Uh, supination and pronation is associated with your palms, um, movement of your hand. So if you are in, so notice this would be anatomical position if I'm standing straight, thumb, okay, imagine this is to the lateral side, okay, if you turn your thumb to the inside, okay, you can see how you get that crossover, you can see the X produced by the ulna and the radius, and what we associate with supination and pronation, the easy way to think about that is if the palm is facing up, so if you bend your elbow at 90 degrees, you have your palm facing up, you're holding a cup of soup, if you turn it over, you spill the soup. Okay, so soup, palm face up, pronation, goes down, you lose it. Opposition has to do with the fact that, remember, we are told we have, we are animals with opposable thumbs. Well, that means that your thumb can come and meet your fingers, and that's what gives us the ability to grip things, and by all accounts has set us apart from all the other primates.